factors affecting the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. So you need to be aware of three different factors. They are leading questions, post-event discussion and anxiety. Now, leading questions and post-event discussion can be grouped together in misleading information. And anxiety is a standalone and you will look at the positive and negative effects of anxiety and how it affects accuracy of eyewitness testimony. So if we look at misleading information, starting with leading questions. So a leading question is a question which is worded or phrased in such a way that can influence the answer. So it's suggesting to the witness that there is a desired answer and it can distort and affect their ability to remember the crime that they have seen. So it can affect the accuracy of the eyewitness testimony. So this was investigated by Loftus and Palmer in 1974. They were interested in the effects of leading questions on eyewitness testimony. So 45 American students were shown seven, seven different videos of car accidents. Um, there were five different groups and they were all asked a series of questions about the accidents that they had seen. There was one critical leading question in the list of questions about how fast the cars were going when they and the verb was changed depending on the group. So there are five different verbs. So the sentence was either how fast were the cars going when they smashed? How fast were the cars going when they collided? How fast were the cars going when they bumped? How fast were the cars going when they hit? How fast were the cars going when they collided? Now they found that when the verb contacted was used, it produced a mean estimate speed of about 31.8 miles per hour compared to smashed, which resulted in a mean of 40.5 miles per hour. So participants who had received the critical question with um, smashed as a verb reported a higher mean estimate than those that received the verb contacted. Now, if you can't remember the exact um, miles per hour in the exam, then just write something along the lines of those that received um, the word smashed reported a higher speed than those that had the word contacted. If you can remember the mean or the about 40 miles per hour, about 31 miles per hour, then you're showing the examiner you have a strong range of information. Now they concluded that the strength of the verb seem to bias their recall of the speed because it seemed to suggest to the question uh, lead the participants in suggesting a faster speed so they concluded that eyewitness testimony is affected by leading questions and it decreases the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. Remember, we are looking at the effects of accuracy and so talk about how it impacts on their ability to accurately and truthfully recall what they have seen. So if we look at the evaluation of this, now we are looking at research, so we're going to use the acronym of GRAVE. So can we generalise these findings? Now it's only done on a marriage American college students. So the sample is biased. It lacks population validity. So we need to be cautious when generalizing these findings to the wider target population, i.e. the whole population. So the fact that it's on college students might have a, a problem. So they are a specific type of student uh, population. They might represent a slightly more intelligent sector of um, society. They might represent a si sector of society that might be from a different background. Um, also, if they're college students, may they be actually that aware of um, driving and the speeds of cars. The fact that it was only done in America might pose a problem. So 
it's only done in America, therefore it's ethnocentric. So it's only done in one culture um, that might bias the results. It is reliable though, and it has reliability because we can replicate and reproduce the study. Due to the standardised procedures and the standardised instructions, other psychologists would be able to take Loftus and Palmer's research and replicate it. Therefore, we can test the consistency of this. And it has been found quite consistently that eyewitness testimony is negatively impacted by leading questions. Now, it does have some important applications and Loftus herself believes that leading questions can have such a distorting effect on memory that the police need to be really careful when they are questioning their eyewitnesses and when they are doing interviews. They need to make sure that they don't use any leading questions that could suggest an answer because it has such a negative impact on the accuracy. So therefore, this has led to changes in the way that the police will conduct interviews. This demonstrates the importance of psychological research within society. Now, in terms of validity, we have some issues surrounding this. So yes, it is a lab experiment, therefore it has high internal validity due to the strict control over extraneous variables. So it is likely that Loftus and Palmer are measuring the effects of leading questions on accuracy of eyewitness testimony and recall. It is unlikely that it is down to an extraneous third variable. Therefore, we can be quite confident in establishing cause and effect. It is unlikely that any other extraneous variable has confounded the result. However, due to the artificial nature of watching a video of a crime, reduces the reliability. So it could be that participants are aware of what they are taking part in. So there could be some demand characteristics there. Also, watching a video of a crime is very different to watching seeing a crime in everyday life. Ethics, not really that many ethical issues. Um, it's unlikely that they would put it there might be protection from harm, but it's unlikely that there was any more harm than they would experience in everyday life. Um, so moving on to the second part of misleading information, we have post-event discussion. Now, post-event discussion is when uh, witnesses will talk about the crime afterwards and it could lead to a distortion of their memory. Now, this can happen through memory contamination. So it's when they're there information that they have seen is mixed with the other witnesses information and it becomes distorted and mismatched and leads to um, inconsistencies or there could be memory conformity so witnesses will go along with another witness to win social approval or they believe the other witness is correct now to investigate this Gabba Tatel wanted to see whether the effects of post-event discussion affected accuracy of eyewitness testimony. They had pairs of participants watch a crime video, but each pair, each person in that pair, sorry, saw the crime from a different viewpoint, from a different angle. They then discussed about what they had seen. They found that 71% wrongly recalled things that they had discussed, but not seen. Now, there was a control group where there was no discussion, so they'd just seen the crime from the, their own angle, and there were no errors in their um, eyewitness testimony statement. So, therefore, it is likely that the post-event discussion was the thing that was leading to this negative impact on eyewitness testimony. So, they concluded that post-event discussion reduces the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. So evaluation then of this sort of area of research. So there could be cautions about generalising the findings from this study to real life crimes. So Foster et al says that when you witness a crime in real life it has important 
consequences. So it's very different to watching a video of a crime. So when you are witnessing a real crime, you're probably going to be aware that you will be, this is important, you will be needed to give a statement. This could lead to a person being prosecuted, um, being put on trial, maybe going to prison. So therefore, it could be that actually eyewitness testimony in real life has is more accurate than those within research settings because there, there isn't that important consequence later on. Um, there's again there's high re reliability due to the standardised procedures it could be replicated if you wanted to. Um, application so police forces can try and prevent witnesses from talking about the crime to other people um, interview witnesses separately to try and reduce this um, negative impact on eyewitness testimony. Again, artificial task, video of a crime lacks external validity. So it's very different, different to what witnessing a real life accident. It's less stressful. And um, when we look at anxiety, actually, watching a traumatic real life um, crime could lead to actually an enhanced positive impact on the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. So this might not be actually that valid um, in explaining accuracy of eyewitness testimony in real life. Again, not really sure about the ethics because um, it was a video of a crime not necessarily causing great anxiety or distress to participants, not really anything more distressful or harmful than they'd experience in everyday life. So questions about misleading information then. So you could get a specific question asking about the accuracy of eyewitness testimony and leading questions. So outline and evaluate research into the effects of leading questions. Now it's worth mentioning that research in this situation can mean explanations and theories. So you can talk about what leading questions are and then research studies into um, leading questions and accuracy of eyewitness testimony. You might also get an eight marker or a 16 marker on outline and evaluate research into the effects of misleading information. Now with this one, it's not specifying whether you talk about leading questions or post event discussion. So it is up to you whether you would do one in lots of detail. So just leading questions in lots of detail or do both in less detail. Now it might be beneficial to try and do um, both leading questions and post event discussion in less detail because you're showing the examiner you have that range of information. Similarly, you could be asked a specific question about a research study. So it's important that you do know Loftus and Palmer's and Gabbett's research inside out. So describe at least one research study into misleading information. Again, it's not specifying whether that is leading questions or post event discussion. It is up to you which one you pick. In your answer, you should include details about what participants were asked to do and what the results were found. Now, this is asking for procedure and findings. So don't tell me the aims. Get straight in there with three key points about procedure, three key points about the findings. So what participants had to do in the study and then what researcher found out as a result from that. Moving on to anxiety then. Now, it seems to be that anxiety has um, an inverted U curve linear relationship. So i.e. that there is an optimum level of anxiety. So too low anxiety and accuracy of eyewitness testimony isn't really there. So you're not anxious, you're not gonna pay attention, you don't have that accurate recall because you didn't pay attention to what was going on. Too much anxiety and you can't focus, you are too stressed, you're too anxious 
and again it would have a negative impact on your ability to recall accurately what you had seen. In between there might be an optimum level which leads to an enhanced ability to recall what you had witnessed. So we're going to look at two research studies. Johnson and Scott is going to look at the negative effects of eyewitness uh, anxiety on eyewitness testimony. So they wanted to look at the effects of a weapon on eyewitness testimony. So a weapon focus could be when a weapon such as a knife, a gun um, or anything that can cause harm causes the participant or the witness to focus to look at the central details i.e the weapon so that draws their attention therefore they are less likely to focus on the peripheral information around them such as what the perpetrator looks like so participants were asked to wait in a reception area and they heard a disagreement in an adjoining room now in condition one a man came out holding a paper knife and had blood on his hands. So that was the high anxiety group. In condition two, a man came out of the room holding pen and he had ink on his hands. That was the low anxiety group. They then had to identify the man from 50 photographs. It was found that recall was more accurate in the low anxiety group. So 49% of participants correctly identified the man from the 50 photos compared to 33% for the high anxiety condition. So it's led researchers to conclude that weapon focus has a negative effect on eyewitness testimony. So in the high anxiety group, participants focused on the weapon as a source of danger, so therefore Anxiety reduces the accuracy of recall and recognition and identification of a perpetrator. Christiansen and Hubinet looks at the positive effects of anxiety on eyewitness testimony. So they investigated the effects of anxiety on real life crimes. So they questioned 58 real witnesses to bank robberies in Sweden. Now the witnesses were either the victim, the bank teller, the high anxiety condition or bystanders so other witnesses around them so other uh, customers within the banks or other employees so low anxiety condition the researchers found that all witnesses showed really good memories of the bank robbery even after a couple of months so they were 75 percent accurate in recall however the witnesses who had been the victims, so those in the high anxiety group, actually had the best recall. So they concluded that anxiety has a positive effect on the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. It's actually enhancing the ability to recall the information. So if we look back at Grave, so it's ethnocentric. Um, it was only based on Swedish. Um, bank robberies for the real life crime. Now it could be that they do something different in Sweden that leads to more accurate recall. So they could have differences in the police forces and interview techniques. Now therefore we should be really cautious when applying the findings from just one uh, country or one culture to all other aspects. Um, Reliability. So when we sort of looked at conflicting evidence, um, Pickle says that it's not the weapon that is causing anxiety. A weapon is causing surprise. Therefore, you look at it. You're not expecting to see it. It's not causing anxiety. It's just a surprise. So he did a research uh, where participants watched um, a scene within um, a hair salon. Now, the weapon in some conditions were things that you would expect to see within a hair salon. So <clears throat> it was a wallet and scissors. Now, a wallet 
low anxiety, not going to cause any concern. Scissors are a weapon, should be causing high anxiety, but you'd expect to see them in a hair salon. Now, he did it also with a handgun, not expecting to see that in um, a hair salon, and it is a weapon, high anxiety, and a raw chicken. Now, it's unlikely that that's going to be a weapon, but it is highly unusual to see a raw chicken within a hair salon. Now, it was found that eyewitness testimony was poorer for the surprise items, so the highly unusual items, so the handgun and the chicken. So weapon focus effect is due to the unusualness of the object rather than the anxiety of it. So even though scissors were a weapon, they weren't unusual and didn't cause that response. Application, not really any application we can talk about, but maybe talk about um, aftercare and trying to calm down um, victims. But we have high ecological validity. So in Johnson and Scott's experiments, participants were weren't aware that the study was staged. They weren't aware that um, they were taken apart in a study to test their eyewitness testimony. And they didn't know that the argument that they heard was between Confederates and actors. Also, um, Christiansen and Hubernet's study was a natural experiment using real crime, so therefore has high ecological validity. Issues surrounding most research, though, into eyewitness testimony is that generally they are lab based and involve watching uh, filmed crime. Therefore, there could be demand characteristics within it. Also, there are ethical issues with this piece of research or these research. So they're asking participants to recall quite a stressful situation, which may cause anxiety or they are either causing a very anxious situation so participants are not being protected from psychological harm so creating anxiety is breaking a code of ethics so if we to look at some questions that there have been on anxiety so We've got one that is outlined one research study into the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. Again, this isn't being specific about anxiety, misleading questions, leading questions or post event discussion. Um, we've got a 16 marker that's outlined evaluate research into the effects of anxiety on the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. So I'd do my A1 paragraph on what anxiety is and the relationship between anxiety and um, I would test me, so I talk about the curved linear model. I would then describe um, the positive effects of eyewitness testimony, so Hubernet's uh, uh, study with the Swedish bank tellers and bank robberies. I then maybe talk about the negative effects of eyewitness testimony, so um, Johnson and Scott's study with a paper knife and weapon focus. And then I'd move on to my evaluation, three to four evaluation points, as long as I point evidence, explain and link them. Similarly, there has been a question that is an application question. So what I would do with application questions, I would maybe not read, I know this seems counterintuitive, maybe not read the situation or the scenario first. I would move straight to the, the question. So I'd find the last bit, discuss research into two or more factors into the effects of reliability of eyewitness testimony. So I would write, highlighted that. Discuss means outline and evaluate. Two or more factors affecting the reliability of eyewitness testimony. Again, knowing the spec, I know that that means the factors that affect eyewitness testimony are leading questions, post-event discussion and anxiety. Refer to information above in your answer. Therefore, I know that the scenario above must contain information about eyewitness uh, anxiety, post-event discussions and leading questions. Therefore, Highlighter at the ready, I'm going to pick out those three key factors. So a woman is being questioned by the police officer about a heated argument she witnessed 
an evening out with friends. The argument took place in a bar and ended with a violent assault. A knife was later discovered by the police in the car park of the bar. Okay. It's a heated argument, it's a violent assault, a knife was discovered. She is going to be anxious. So we can talk about how anxiety is going to affect eyewitness testimony. Did you see the knife the attacker was holding? That is an example of a leading question. We've got our anxiety, we've got our leading question. I now need to find some post-defense discussion happening. I'm not sure that there was a knife. Yes, there probably was, replied the woman. I was so scared at the time that it's hard to remember. And my friends and I have talked about what happened so many times since that I'm not sure what I did see. So she's discussed with her friends what has happened. We've got post-event discussion. So remember, application questions. I would do my AO1 paragraph about anxiety. Then I would do my AO2 paragraph about how, where in the scenario there is anxiety and how this could affect her eyewitness testimony. So you could talk. Now, either the anxiety is going to lead to a positive effect on her accuracy and reliability. So it's going to increase her recall or it's going to decrease her recall. So remember to link the scenario for her eyewitness testimony and how these three factors are going to affect her accuracy and her reliability in giving the eyewitness testimony.